Yes, good morning, everybody. Thank you for all those who have uh, gotten up for, to listen to my speech. Um, I know that politicians discussed the uh, abolishment of summertime. I, am, I was very unhappy this morning that they haven't agreed yet on me. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, I'd like to present you how uh, this new museum in Brussels interprets heritage. And when I say interpreting heritage, it, it means it has two, two different meanings. First of all, how do we interpret what is European heritage? What is it for us? Does it exist? Uh, and second, how do we interpret it for our visitors? Um, so, um, I'm going to take you through, well, one point perhaps, because the topic of this conference is heritage and identity, and I'm going to speak a bit, little bit less about identity. I hope you won't leave now. <laughs> but I will explain you why we have uh, some issues with, with the concept that we don't um, actively um, use it for our museum. So uh, the talk has four parts, which I've just tried to shorten a bit to keep you awake. Um, the first part is just some uh, introductory remarks about what the museum is, when it opened, etc. The second is uh, a very seemingly simple question, what is European history? Uh, the uh, third one is, what is European heritage for us? And the fourth, how do we think this European heritage was shaped? And uh, for the third part, I use my, the, our permanent exhibition as an example, and for the fourth part, our first temporary exhibition. So first of all, um, and now I have to learn how to use this, uh, about the museum itself. Um, the idea is already from 2007, but it was only actually, uh, we only started the work as a curatorial team in 2011, because the European Parliament, who is the founder and initiator, had the, the MEPs had to agree on finding a budget and agree in principle that the Parliament would carry through a museum, which is uh, quite an unusual uh, thing to do. Um, so, uh, six years of work, because we opened in May last year, and it's the first ever attempt to present European history, to present a European perspective on history in a museum, because as you know, there are uh, books about European history, there are national, regional, and local museums, but there had not been any museum about um, European history as such, and this is the first attempt. Now, some people think that this is an EU museum, in which the EU defines what history is and how it should be seen, but this is not the case. The uh, European Parliament was the initiator, but our team of historians and museum professionals worked really independently, and we continue to, to do so, thanks God, otherwise I think we would with our jobs, because uh, if we had political interference in the content, we, we would have uh, big problems. So uh, we, um, we uh, work in an international team of museum curators and uh, historians, which we brought together in Brussels. Quite uh, difficult also to find people across Europe to come and work there. And at present, we have colleagues from 18 different nationalities. It was a hard work to agree on a joint narrative, and whether we have managed to produce something credible, you would perhaps tell me after this presentation. Um, I, I won't take you through all these floors. These are the um, exhibition floors, five <coughs> levels of permanent exhibition, the upper five levels, and two levels of temporary exhibition. And I invite you to come and visit in Brussels, because today I won't take you like, through all the museum, but I will concentrate on the topics that I have just mentioned. So, um, a short glimpse of our mission, what we want to do. This is an image from Museum Night Fever from uh, two weeks, two, three weeks ago. So uh, we do have a small section on the 19th century um, history, but mainly the museum is mainly about 20th century history. Um, and so it's four floors in total. And then there is a red thread about European integration or European Union history, but it's only one little um, line throughout the exhibition. It's not the main uh, core mission because the um, it's a house of European history and not a house of history of the European Union, so that's a very different, very important difference to be made. Um, the permanent exhibition offers many different layers, which allows for a visit according to certain themes. So those who don't want to, who want to focus or to come back for a second or third time, they can concentrate on certain themes like migration or the history of communism, the history of democracy, or the history of European integration, and we will develop these themes um, in, uh, in our guided tours um, uh, to, to cater for different interests. 
something really unique and which has been a nightmare for us and is still is uh, that we have to offer the exhibition in 24 languages. Um, <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning that uh, we cannot write texts on the wall. We have to use a tablet. Um, we use a tablet where every visitor can select its language at the beginning when they start. Um, it's, we are testing it. It's not an easy tool because many people are not used to going through a museum looking into a device. Uh, or they are uh, happy to, to get rid of a device when, for once they don't have to use their mobile. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite tough and um, also the functionalities we are testing them, but it does, it does give the information. Um, it, it's triggered automatically when people go through the museum so, so that they, they get the content of the section where they are and then they can select what they want to uh, read or listen to because it's both an audio and, and a reading device and it has voiceovers for films and so on. But in the development phase it was really an absolute nightmare because the translation services we used, they, they are not always historians, so the, the, the terms were not, were not correct. Then we had lawyers who worked on legal text normally, uh, so in, in translation of legal text you have to stick very closely to the original and we need museum-like text, short sentences for tired visitors, so it was quite a, a tough process. <coughs> so, Apart from exhibitions and uh, the tablet that I mentioned, we, we have developed some online resources, um, some, a little website, um, we carry out workshops uh, on different topics linked to a permanent exhibition and based on the Henley collection and we have started organizing events such as history debates where we always try to bring um, together diff people from different parts of Europe. So our mission is always a European one to try to, um, to create debate on, on European uh, history. Um, we understand our house as a forum for learning, reflection and debate and I will explain you more in detail what we mean with that. We don't want to impose one view, we, we want to question a lot and, and, and you will see how we do that. So let's start with this questioning and the first question is what is, what is Europe? Because the problem when we started working this exhibition is that in contrast to other continents, Europe has no natural borders, except at, at, at its western limits, and it cannot be clearly defined geographically. The cartographic image of Europe changes with the time period and with the perspective of the beholder. And it follows from this that Europe is a separate continent only in the perception of people, not in the fact. Therefore, Europe's borders are essentially cultural, and we perceive Europe as a cultural term. And this is, this is explained in the first uh, room of our permanent exhibition, which you see here. Um, and uh, you see the left, the showcase on the left side is the very first one that people see, and it is dedicated to the myth of Europa. Um, and here, so we confront uh, the myth of Europa. <coughs> this question of what is Europe, where does it, its name come from, um, and then later on also what is European history and what is European heritage. And like that, the visitors confronted from the very beginning of our permanent exhibition with a critical approach and uh, he sees, actually interpretation is the first thing he sees, because this first showcase on the left side shows that the myth of Europe are interpreted differently across the centuries by artists uh, or by the church. And so, from the very beginning, it's clear that the way you look, you interpret Europe uh, depends on from when, when you do it and uh, where you geographically stand and the whole um, background you have. So this Phoenician Princess Europa, abducted by Zeus, sorry for my German accent, I'm not that one actually, although I did it. Um, uh, she, she, according to this myth, um, this, um, they, uh, this princess has given the continent its name and this story has been reinterpreted from various points of view over time. Um, so you see, for example, we, we show in our exhibition from 17th, 18th century the iconography of Europe as with a crown which shows the superiority over other continents which you often see in Baroque paintings. Uh, the presumed superiority or the perceived superiority but we also show in this showcase a little painting called Baba Bomba, so it shows the total destruction of Europe in the, after World War II. So you see a very different um, points of view on, on Europe. In the film, which is <coughs> there, projected on the 
um, table in this first room, we highlight historical phenomena which have shaped the European continent in many different ways, such as migration, the multiplicity of uh, different power centers, the resounding impact of Greek and Roman antiquity, the dominance of Christianity and the changing borders and many other phenomena. So this is really an introductory section um, because as I've told you, the exhibition is mainly about 20th century, but here this is really a, a prologue to the whole um, permanent exhibition. Now, we've seen the question, what is Europe? Now, which history do we tell? This is a very complicated question because some people say that European history does not exist. Uh, they say that we, there is only national history. There cannot be any European one. <laughs> So um, we have asked ourselves the question, can we find a common, common ground when we look at history from a viewpoint that is not national? <coughs> All history is a construct and we, uh, create, we try to create a plausible one based on the critical use of different sources. And um, we, we, we have a central atrium sculpture, which you see here running through the uh, five floors of the permanent exhibition, and which again uses the notion of interpretation to show, uh, to demonstrate um, this constructed, um, the discursive character of historiography. Uh, so um, the uh, branches of this sculpture, which you can see here in an abstract way, and then on the left side also in the, in the design, um, they show quotations from different time periods by contemporary witnesses, philosophers, politicians or historians who comment on the respective um, historical period and the earliest quotations from Herodotus and it, it, it is connected to the showcase that I just showed you about the name of Europe because this first quote actually says um, we are not sure um, but we think that the name of the continent comes from this um, from this from this myth of Europe from the princess Europa. So uh, viewed together, these, uh, this uh, sculpture is 50, uh, 25 meters tall and it is in the um, central atrium, as I said, and it's a um, symbolic expression of the dynamic of European history and its never-ending interpretations. And what we want to show with these two, uh, speaking about interpretation in this um, kind of um, explicit way, we also want to stress that our view on European history is an interpretation because if we had been a different team, in a different time period, our exhibition would have been a, another one. So it's just one possible view. Now, which history do we present? Um, we have to find three criteria. Oops, sorry. Um, to, to select what from the huge amount of available content we, we select for the quite small surface, while well, it's, it's 2,800 square meters in total, which is quite big, but for European history is still too small. <laughs> so um, we have um, selected these criteria to select the, the topics because it is not uh, a juxtaposition of national histories. Often we are asked um, where is the Polish room or where is the Hungarian room because people expect to come in a museum where there will be one room per country. But this is not our idea because the, the national museums do this very well to look at history from a uh, national perspective. Here we, um, we have defined some processes which, as the three criteria see, uh, say, um, have originated in Europe and have spread across the whole continent, with some exceptions sometimes, and uh, the, which are still considered relevant today. This is a very important criterion for us. So this, the themes that you will find in our exhibition um, for 19th and 20th century history, they have been selected according to these three criteria. So you can easily imagine the world was, for example, that they qualify. They, they were born in Europe, they spread across almost the whole continent and um, have a huge impact for today. So this is just to give you an example how the themes of the uh, permanent exhibition were selected. So based on this methodology, we created our permanent exhibition um, and we had to create some kind of um, easy to understand narrative for those people who have no clue, for those people who don't know anything about history. So for them it looks quite unified and simple on the first glance, but then as I explained there are different layers where you can go deeper and you can get more, um, more um, um, information. 
But we also look actually at the different perceptions. So it is a bit complex. Here we have tried to create something unified, a narrative which shows these historical processes. But we would also like to address that uh, even if the world war has affected most Europeans, it is perceived in very different ways according to how you look at it. And this is where we come to um, the use of the concept of memory. And I'd like to explain you that we, we had discussions in 2011 when we started to build a museum about identity. Um, should we use identity? Because the politicians who suggested our creation, they said we should, this museum should create European identity. And we had long discussions about this and we, we actually disagreed because we think that identity is something fixed. Um, it does, it's not sure that the European identity exists and if there are many different uh, ways of defining it. Um, and we found this model too reductionist. We, we, we want to stimulate debate, so we rather went for the, um, for the notion of memory to, to look at the differences, what is shared, what is divided, and I will, I will explain you how, how we do that. Memory is, um, for us, memory, I don't know if you know the thing about collective memory, it was in, uh, introduced by Maurice Halbach in the 1920s and recently uh, there, have been, there has been a lot of literature out there, Pierre Nora and uh, Jan and Alaida Asman, who have suggested to use this, this term. Um, and we like it because of its openness, it is something which can evolve uh, and it allows a multiplicity of perspective, whereas identity is rather um, trying to, to find a unified um, perspective. <coughs> Memory is uh, a basis for the self-understanding and learning, whether as individuals or as members of a social group. And we show in our exhibition how memory and oblivion are uh, go together, because memory keeps certain events vivid, either individually or in a society, by repressing, substituting, uh, or uh, trans transcribing something else. So um, memory goes with oblivion. Um, and we use this notion of memory and oblivion as a red thread which comes back at several times in our exhibition narrative. First we start with a reflection of, um, about memory, that's in the same section that I showed you, this int introductory section. And then we deal with different ways of um, dealing with a painful history, uh, memory of uh, the Holocaust after World War II. Um, and we present memory conflict after the fall of the Iron Curtain. So this topic comes back also several times in, in our exhibition. Just two examples on how we describe how we described it, the different uses of memory, because it, memory is also being politicized. Um, it can be used for rec reconciliation, like you see on the left, um, sorry, the left slide, uh, the commemoration of the Joint Battle of Verdun in 1984, which marked um, the reconciliation of his, uh, between Germany and France. But memory can also be manipulated to erase and undermine, and this is often used um, by governments or by politicians who want to create a certain identity based on history and um, to change history, the course of history for, uh, for that. And uh, here I will show you the, the right picture which shows the airbrushing of history, because here there, this is a picture of a, um, of a speech of Lenin that Lenin gave in 1920. Uh, and in 1920, there were Leon Trotsky and Lev Kamenev, they were standing there on the podium with him. But in 1929, uh, they, they uh, were not friends of Stalin anymore, and they were removed and erased from the picture. <laughs> we tried to see that. So we'd like to show how, how this is being instrumentalized and um, yeah, also to stimulate debate. Here yeah, I've mentioned this, this is the section of uh, memory of the Shoah or the Holocaust after uh, World War II. Um, and here we also have two quotes which, are, um, which show a bit the, how can I say, the, the span between memory and oblivion. A Churchill in 1946 recommended uh, a blessed act of oblivion. He said, we have to forget, otherwise we cannot go on after these atrocities. Um, but Elie Wiesel, the Nobel Peace Prize winner in 1986, said, uh, we have to remember, uh, if anything can, it is memory that will save humanity. Without memory, there is no hope. 
So you see these two poles uh, between memory and oblivion of uh, the horrible history of the 20th century um, is something that we, we reflect upon. And then the question is, after the end of the East-West Division, um, how do we remember um, the uh, communist past versus the, uh, the past, the Holocaust remembrance? Um, here we would also like, we have a section in our exhibition about the uh, shared and divided memory after uh, the fallout of the Iron Curtain. Um, and uh, this is an area where lots of debates are, are ongoing and where we, we think it shows that um, there is no such thing at the moment as a common European memory. It is uh, something that is under discussion and um, it's important to understand each other's point of view and each other's perspective. Against this uh, theoretical background of reflecting about Europe, history and memory, uh, now I come to the topic, sorry, it, I have been a bit long before, it, uh, about what is European heritage for us. Um, and uh, I'd like to stress about the definition of heritage that in the permanent exhibition due to the nature of our museum, we are mainly interested by <coughs> historical heritage, so not uh, cultural heritage. We, we are a bit uh, larger in the temporary exhibition where we speak about a lot of about, about our, the cultural heritage. So, um, in the exhibition we um, chose to accentuate historical phenomena as points for discussion. Um, and um, I'll show you this here. This is a, the, the Heritage Showcase, which is also in the first exhibition, in the first room of the exhibition together with the, um, with the uh, Myth of Europa. And here we, we defined um, 14 different moments, 14 different uh, phenomena, which we think, um, according to the literature, we could consider being part of European heritage. But the question is, would everyone agree? Would every European agree? And I just mentioned what we, what we selected there. And every, every um, notion is represented by one object, historical object, and one uh, contemporary photo photography underneath to question its relevance for today, because as I've mentioned before, this is always a, uh, an important uh, question for us. So uh, we start from the left, and it is chronologically based, and we have Greek and antiquity, we have, and we have democracy, Roman law, Christianity, um, well, the dominance of Christianity. We, we acknowledge that the other religions were part of Europe's history as well, but the, the political dominance, um, that is what is meant here, it's represented by a pope. Um, humanism, the colonial expansion from the 15th century onwards, slave trade, uh, state terror, after the pe um, starting here after the period of the French Revolution, uh, revolutions themselves, the nation state, Marxism, communism, and socialism, capitalism, uh, the Holocaust, and totalitarianism. So you see that it's a selection of what we think belongs to European heritage, which is uh, which encompasses the positive as the negative. So in that sense, we are very different from, um, let's say, some, some speeches which like to stress enlightenment. Sorry, I forgot to mention enlightenment, I think. Yeah. Enlightenment is also part of that. Um, we mentioned positive terms like enlightenment, humanism, etc. But we, we really want to acknowledge also the dark chapters of our history. So the question is, can we agree on this? Can, can Europeans agree on this? And some of the things we mentioned, they don't concern all the countries, like um, not all the countries, European countries, were colonial powers. So there's always this question of how do we relate to this, uh, depending on where we come from. These, these are just some examples of uh, the objects we showed um, for Christianity, Enlightenment, and um, democracy. Um, just to show you briefly how we uh, came to um, our museum, that's a little parenthèse, uh, like I say in French, a little uh, between brackets. Um, because as, as, you, as I told you, we started from nothing. We had to build up this museum from scratch, so there was no prior collection. Um, and we had to assemble um, the uh, museum collection from um, from anywhere in Europe, because we wanted to be a representation of European diversity. We, the easiest would have to be would have been to go to the big Belgian, German, or um, uh, Dutch collections, you know, which are just around Brussels. It would have been the cheapest 
and to fill the museum from there because you can find something about revolutions, you can find something about um, many, many topics that we cover. But we, we, the aim was to have a European heritage, European heritage, the European collection in, in our museum. So this is how we search for objects. Another nightmare, I have to say, <laughs> because um, as you know, um, not many, not all museum collections are online available. So uh, we, in, in many cases, we had to go to the museums, we had to go to the countries uh, where we had the budget to go um, to speak to the curators or even to write to the museums to ask uh, how, what do you have on um, World War One or a um, certain topic. Um, and these, this is the result. So we, we do have now objects in permanent and temporary exhibition from uh, 37 countries and over 300 institutions. Um, but I think there's still uh, things which can be um, improved because in, in the last rush we had to go to some bigger collections to uh, to get more uh, to get the last objects because also the uh, loan contracts were very very complicated to make. And uh, in the last months we had to go to some bigger ones and there we will, but as, as it's a permanent exhibition but based on loans, it's actually a temporary exhibition because it, the loans keep changing according to, their, to the duration they have. This, uh, we are connecting also ourselves, but uh, we don't want to duplicate any national collection, so we will, uh, everything we don't need for the permanent exhibition, we, we are developing our collecting policy which uh, really um, concentrates on those issues which are not connected by national or regional or local museums and they are mainly um, um, European Union related. You see here in the upper corner the Nobel Peace Prize which was given to the European Union in uh, 2012 and this was the first time that we, we did contemporary collection, collecting. We went there and we, um, we collected um, all kinds of um, objects around, the documents around this these events, um, not only these nice ones, which our uh, funders like to see, but also demonstration banners against the European Union, um, the, the situation of uh, things about the situation of Norway, which is not part of the EU, and so critical views on, on European Union history. So this is our uh, collecting um, policy. Now, uh, one quick glance, uh, and then I will finish on our temporary exhibition. Uh, the first temporary exhibition is called Interactions um, because we um, find that today's interconnected world is not a new phenomenon but that it is based on a long history of entanglement and mutual influence um, because from distant times to the present day cross-cultural interactions have, um, have had an impact on our uh, heritage and um, this is what we try to show in, in this exhibition. So we have one um, lower section in which we go into different types of interaction, different types of encounters. Uh, this is the trade section. And we show how when traders, diplomats, um, or mercenaries, or soldiers uh, traveled across the continent either to trade or to fight or to negotiate peace, um, they brought goods, ideas, and technology from one place to the other. And, um, and there were also those who traveled for learning, for like the Grand Tour, or um, people who traveled uh, for earning their money at a, at a court or in a cultural capital. And this is what we show in this lower section. So we, we describe Europe as a space which, on a quite small continent, or not quite a subcontinent, um, concentrated um, many different territories. Now we know the 40, I think 47 countries, but in the, under the uh, Rome, Holy Roman Empire, for example, there were 300 territories at a certain time period only in the Holy Roman Empire. So it has always been a space which was subdivided in uh, many small entities, and this uh, has created um, frequent uh, occasions for contact and for conflict and for cooperation. So both conflict and cooperation somehow go together uh, because we show here that after the major conflicts they, there were always attempts to prevent another big conflict and uh, to, uh, to sign peace treaties or to find forms of cooperation um, which prevent another uh, major war. And so this is the negotiation section and uh, as you see um, interactions is not only the content of this exhibition but it's also the way in which it can be discovered because um, we have created a, an exhibition where the form should follow its content 
and it has been conceived as an experience for visitors who enjoy interacting and participating and it is very multi-sensory so, so people can uh, smell perfume, they can lie on a bed, they can, um, they can uh, smell spices and so on. So it's a very interactive exhibition. So here you see the game section. Um, and this is the upper floor where we don't look at the encounters as such anymore, but at the result they have in European heritage. Um, and here, in, for example, we show how games, um, there, there are some ori there are originals, but then next to them we, we do have the real games, but uh, with the originals, the history of these games is explained, is explained how they are influenced by, um, how they come from outside of Europe, how they are transported into Europe, and how they change when they, when they change countries. Uh, this is the kitchen, so because it's created like the room of a house. Um, and um, here we show that um, there is food is an area in which you can show the history of Europe as a history of communication and cultural contact. Um, and uh, that food is, is really a catalyst for transfer processes. Um, and we show, uh, actually, we, we show many things which we have in the permanent exhibition is quite serious topics. We show here in a quite light way. Like, for example, the construction of national myths. Um, here, I'm sorry, it's hard to see, but there's a croissant on the table that everyone would associate with French. Um, but the story is much more complex because the baker came from Vienna. Um, the same for the pizza, which is here in the oven. <laughs> uh, today, for us, it is synonymous with Italy. Um, but actually, the, the ingredients have arrived over the course of history. So the tomatoes come from South Africa. Wheat flour from the Middle East, mozzarella is made from the milk of uh, Asiatic water buffalo, and basil is native to India. So only olive oil and oregano are actually Mediterranean ingredients in pre-human times, and actually uh, pizza changed over time, so it was red only, obviously, from the time when tomatoes arrived in Rome. Uh, so pizza is therefore a globalized food, and um, we, with these little stories in this very playful exhibition, we would like to break some, some national stereotypes. And now to finish, this is a game which we have in our temporary exhibition, or an interactive station, which uh, is entirely, uh, the content is entirely generated by the visitors, and it, uh, it actually questions the visitors where they come from, and you will see that the Brussels visit has created a mess here, <laughs> because this is the result <coughs> when you look at the whole. Um, we, um, we ask them, where do you live, where, where's your family from, uh, where have you lived before? Um, but also some questions which are more hypothetical, like, or about their cultural uh, preferences, like which food do you like, which music do you like, um, which, um, uh, where do you go on holiday? And, uh, and this, there's also a website, so the content can also be generated in other parts of Europe and can be fed into the museum. And here you see some interesting results because we can search the results later on. So the left slide is uh, roots and home. It's to combine where people live and where they come from. You can see that this was mainly done by Brussels, people who live in Brussels. Right. You see where they come, where they come from. Um, their, their origins are very often somewhere else. But very interesting if you look at the right slide because their preferences concerning food are very much alike. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, we see this access to Italian food. So um, what we want to show with this is uh, how we how we are all influenced, how our perception of the European space, which is culturally, which is a perception, which is a perception, is shaped by um, by our family history, but also by history at, in a larger sense. Because what I find very sad, um, it's hard to see here, is that. There are many lines going west, um, but there are very few lines, for example, to Russia, which would certainly be different if we weren't based in Brussels, but, uh, but still it shows like the Iron Curtain becomes um, implicitly uh, apparent on these lines to the East that's Asian cuisine, so that's, uh, it's, it's really um, a bit of a sad result, but which we, which we expected somehow. So um, what we want to show with this is for once that we don't look at European map uh, with the little national boxes, but that we look at how, um, how we are shaped by, um, by the way, by, by our family history and, and history in the larger sense. So to finish, I'd just like to say that our exhibition will never be finished because as I said, the objects are rotating. We will also update it because now we're in the face of evaluation. We get many comments and we get also many critical comments. 
and to uh, the interesting the most the most political comment we get is from those people who come and look for their national history. So they come with their uh, perspective, which is normal because we are brought up and we learn that in school. So they come and they want to tick boxes. They look for this and that national hero. Uh, they they um, they they say that they are used to a certain way of seeing history as well. So some countries uh, write history as a history of heroes. Some countries write their history as a history of victims, of uh, being victims. Other countries look at it critically. So people are influenced by, uh, by this and um, they are disturbed by the way we do it. So we, are, we, are, we want to be a place for debate and we want to become aware or make people aware of this different way of, of looking uh, at history. So I hope that uh, we have managed to create something that all Europeans can relate to. Um, so I'm, I really look forward to you telling me if we did or what we, what we could improve um, because we are really in an evaluation phase and we need uh, your advice and input. Um, so thanks a lot for your attention and I'm ready to answer any question that you might have.